Hey everybody, John Ray here with Musing Wizard. I am joined by Carl Brockman, and today we're going to be talking about responsibility, success, the games you're playing. Are you choosing the games that you're playing or are those games being forced upon you? And in those games, how can you find a strategy that is winning and empowering and uplifting and puts you in the outcomes that are desirable to you? So Carl, let's dive into a big concept Concept, success. What does success look like? How do we get it? We're all looking for that in some way. We might give it different language, but curious to know where you want to dive in on this. John, thanks for having me as always. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I'm glad that we're speaking about this this morning. We had a quick yarn before we started recording and it sort of blended to, uh, well, for me anyway, the different games or the different ways that one can live life. And I, I think about my journey and a, a lot of my adult journey uh, has been oriented towards a definition of success that perhaps I didn't define for myself, you know, perhaps someone else's expectations, whether it was a, a, a one of my first leaders, my parents, the peers, uh, the, the things I saw on social media. And uh, this is a really important uh, topic when it comes to the work I do with my clients, you know, business and, and otherwise is, well, what ultimately are we living this life for? You know, what is the ultimate game that we're playing and I think success as a topic is just so multi-dimensional and perhaps the best way to start is just asking yourself John what is your current definition of success and perhaps if you can speak to the evolution of that definition as you've uh, hit 40 now I hope you don't mind me shouting that out to the world congratulations you look younger than uh, a spring chook but yeah what what is success to you mate and, and how has that evolved maybe over the last 10 to 20 years for you yeah well I think it, it's a moving target right and, and and so success for me is kind of like the the outcome that represents you know achieving my current desires and, and and so i've i've always tried to plan out the games that i have based on kind of the the intuitive desire that that i have inside of me i feel like that desire is an energy that that points to an outcome that is possible and and so then part of the game that i play is okay if the desire means that the thing is possible for me and that the energy exists to bring it into manifestation, then how do I reverse engineer that outcome into a series of steps that feels like meaningful progression? And and so I think a lot of times people will identify success as getting the desire, but for me, it's actually more fun to be in meaningful progress towards the desire and the, then to keep growing the desire bigger so that you never actually get there, but you're always in meaningful pursuit of it. And, and that's the adventure, right? Like being somebody who's a, who's a great footballer or, or baseball player, like they're not trying to get the game over with, like they enjoy being in the game. And yeah, there's satisfaction in knowing that you won that one, but but really the the more impactful thing is knowing that you used your body in, in exactly the way that you wanted to. You, you visualized what it could look like and, and you saw yourself perform regardless of the chaos around you at, in, in an optimal, um, with optimal ability. And that's what I'm trying to know myself as is what does it look like to be in meaningful pursuit of something while I'm performing optimally and and then allowing life to just give me different scenarios and challenges and, and, and knowing that those challenges are designed to make me bigger than the challenge. And, and so success for me is really about momentum. It's about motion. It, 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 it's about seeing a vision and and recognizing that vision getting closer to me and and then as it gets closer to me feeling into oh now that it's closer i can see the detail and i can actually see that i want it to be to to be bigger and and this other thing and and to grow it grow that detail and and that means that i never quite get to an end goal but i'm always in that meaningful pursuit like 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 the hunt the chase like if you've ever dated you you you, you know and, and and been on on that chase where where you're like ooh that's the girl that's the, that's the girl and, and 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 then you you start to 
go with your intuition and your gut and, and and that biochemical cocktail that's in you and and using that to bring about the detail of of how you can make this desire a reality and and the the chase is so much fun and and, and it, it's full of so much um knowledge about self and and, and your ability to work with your own bioenergetics and so for me that that type of polarity that that I have with my girlfriend and and kind of the flirtatious nature of of our relationship and and our ability to always bring in novelty in such a way where we're both kind of always in in the chase I try to bring that same energy to everything that I'm doing um and and I want to make love to everything in my life and and and, and Yes, the making love is beautiful and the connection and the intimacy that you have when, when you achieve the outcome is absolutely delicious, but it's only delicious because there was such a, such a um, tantalizing path that you had to go on to get to that moment. And so when it's all said and done and, and you've had the act, you're, you're, you're in the moment of absolute intimacy it's then such an interesting portal to grow. How could it be better next time? Like, like, like we, we, we've identified this level of love to, to such a degree that now we have access to the next level. What does the next level look like? And then the game and the chase becomes the meaningful pursuit of the next level. And of course, there's levels to it always. Like it's a never ending game of, of just upgrading and, and, and acknowledging that you never get it done and you're always in pursuit. So that was a long way of saying that I love momentum. <laughs> That's what's success well, I, to me. <laughs> no, no, I love it. It was a beautifully long winded way to describe success as momentum. There's a few things there that I'm going to pull out so beautifully, but I, I think ultimately uh, uh, we've all been victims of this. Some of us still might be victims of this, right? But it's it's when we put all of our value and weight on the carrot. You know, we're working towards a carrot and we have this assumption that when we get that carrot, then we'll be happy, you know? And I'm sure all of us can resonate with something like that in our lives. If not right now, what someone might be working towards building a business. And we have this idea of what the business looks like, and then we'll be happy. The classic one is the white picket fence with the kids, right? When I have the white picket fence and, and my kids, then I'll be happy. And uh, I think that is such a, a a dangerous assumption because again, we're, we're placing our hopes and dreams and all of these fulfilling, beautiful uh, experiences of life into the future, which creates that disparity in that state of lack now. And again, like we, you mentioned discipline and I'd love to dive into that a little bit more, but for me, discipline isn't the sacrifice of a beautiful life right now. Discipline is the, the focus, the orientation toward that ideal. And as you so uh, beautifully put, the best thing about an ideal is that they don't exist in totality. Per perfection doesn't exist. And as we move towards it, it expands, it evolves. We see more nuance. We see more uh, detail. We get more clarity around potentially what success is. Uh, you, you mentioned something that I thought was was bang on. And that was, well, for me, success is based on my desires at any given time. I think I think that's a truth. I think success is based on one's desire. Again, whether it's a, a conscious uh, a feeling of something that we desire ultimately, or or it's just security or or lack of pain or um, uh, a certainty. Again, the white picket fence thing. Like, oh, I have certainty. I have family. I have uh, I have uh, at that house that will will uh, bear my happiness. So uh, I guess there's no uh, question that was uh, linked to that in, in the forefront of me pulling that out. But what, what a beautiful way to start being more conscious around the success that we're orienting ourselves towards. Yeah, well, it's interesting. My, my girlfriend and I have very different ideas of what success and safety looks like. And, you know, her idea of success is having everything ordered and in its place and safety and a nest egg and, you know, six months worth of expenses or, or more and, you know, a, a cushion in the in the bank account. And my idea of success is 
I'm in my truck and I get to go wherever I want. <laughs> and, and and so that polarity that it does create polarity in in our relationship and and what I've learned being with with my girlfriend, you know, for almost a decade now and and I'll, I'll, I'll make an honest woman of her the, this year, I promise. <laughs> but I've known her for almost 20 years. And, and and what what I've learned from her, what she's taught me, is the discipline part of it. We, you know, we talked to, uh, offline about this concept of loafing and just kind of going around and doing whatever you want and being a vagabond. And that's a very enticing thing um, for a lot of people. But it's a very small game. And what people... I think don't realize is that loafing is you hitchhiking around the country. If we were going to put it into a metaphor where, where adding, keeping the loafing energy, but adding the dis adding a little bit of discipline to it. So, so making it there, there's a little bit of upfront friction. That's what discipline is in order for a smoother ride down, down the line. And, and so Rather than hitchhiking for your entire life, you're just you, it, it's a wasted energy. It's a very slow way to get around, but it's adventuresome. Discipline is you laying railroad tracks. And, and and so at first it feels like you're not getting anywhere, but then you're able to move much more efficiently throughout your life. And and that's what I learned from from my girlfriend is that she was looking for a type of efficiency. That's what she called out of, out of me. She she wanted to play a bigger game where where we could do more with the resources that that we had, um, and and the the potential resources that we had, and and so we've had a really dynamic relationship. In in that, I had to learn how to move from physical loafing to more energetic loafing. I'm still very light in my energy. I still allow things to kind of play themselves out however they play themselves out. I still believe in that that mystery is a very good energy to, to be in. And at the same time, I recognize that there are structures available to me that if I can align myself with, I get to move faster. I get to play bigger games. Things become easier. I, I get to do more. I, I get to wield more power. And that's only possible when you recognize that you can effectively work with the concept of discipline or, or responsibility and you feel through all of your big feelings around challenge because doing anything that is bigger than the current game you're playing is going to feel temporary temporarily uncomfortable it's just like if you want to grow muscle in the gym you're going to have sore muscles for a few weeks before you start to see the the net benefit of that but because it's your body and because the feedback is so immediate you recognize that that's part of the process but it's harder to see when it's abstracted into reality around you yeah yeah and i love the gym analogy it links to a, a great quote by alex hormozy and i'm going to butcher the exact words but it goes along the lines of uh the goal of going to the gym isn't to get healthy it's to stay healthy mm. but the goal of getting into the business isn't to get to an x place in business it's to have a a successful business that stays successful, you know, and that links so beautifully to momentum being a, a uh, definition of success. I think, especially as men, I, I find that uh, in my own life, I'll speak for myself first, that if I, if, if there is a lack of progression in, in health and wealth and relationships in these three great buckets that are good to uh, create some measurement or data around how, how you measure a holistic life. If I'm lacking progress in those areas, in all areas. Well, that's when I am at my worst. That's when I uh, battle with feelings of depression. That's when anxiety uh, spikes. That's when everything feels too hard and, and I don't know what the next step is to take. Or, or perhaps I do know it, but I'm not willing to take the next step because as you have so put beautifully put in the past it's so much easier to move a ship sorry it's so, so much easier to turn a ship that is moving yeah. and for for me and and a lot of the men that i work with it is just 
progression that changes so much of their reality that that allows things to be called in and and spells to be casted so opportunity presents itself it's that it's that moving towards something that seems to well fix a lot of the root problems that i see men and have seen myself struggle with uh i like uh how you spoke about reverse engineering from this this winning platform Tell me, tell me about how that differs between a defi- definition of success being momentum and a definition of success being a, a fixed thing in the yeah. future that we're orienting ourselves towards. Yeah, well, ultimately, the desire shows you less about what you want and more about who you want to be. And so the way that I always think about end outcomes is, well, what kind of person walks around in that outcome? And then I will reverse engineer what are the attributes of that person? What what characteristics do they have? What exchanges do they have with other people? How do they interact with with their significant other? How do they interact with, with their business partners? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? I will build out a character profile of the type of person that walks around in the outcome that I'm interested in in creating. And then I'll forget about the outcome and just focus on what parts of that person I want to become. Yeah, so beautifully put. And and that, I guess, links to how I've come to define success. You know, when I have these conversations with my clients or with my friends and with myself, after a few questions, the material plane no longer exists, right? You ask someone, well, what are you going to do when, if you win the lotto? And they're like, oh, well, I'll, I'll buy I'll buy a house and then I'll pay off my mortgage and then I'll help out my family. And and then there's only say, one, okay. there's only one answer to that question and it's buy Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, yeah, okay, perfect. Now I'll lead everyone down that path. It's like, no, you're wrong. Don't buy the house. Don't help the family. Just buy Bitcoin. Uh, but, but you, okay. And then they'll, they'll say, I'll quit my job. Okay. Well, that's interesting. What would you do with your time? Exactly. What would you do with your time? And so by going through this, this uh, thought journey, we do ultimately come to a, a, a place of being or a definition of being. And for me, it's, well, I want to feel purpose. I want to feel fulfillment. I want to feel joy. I want to feel adventure. And regardless of the orientation of the reality around me, these are the things that I define as success. If I have a yacht or not, if I have a yacht and I'm not feeling joy or not feeling adventure or fulfillment or love, then what's the point of a yacht? Naval has that great quote is like, if you can't enjoy a coffee, uh, in the morning, then you won't enjoy a coffee on a yacht. And again, I completely butchered the words of that, but the premise is there. <laughs> right. Well, and it just comes down to understanding like who you want to be, because it's so much easier to manifest who you want to be than to manifest the outcome, be, be because there's a time lag in physical reality. And, and, and so the psychological element is not as um, c- encumbered by time, be, be because it's to some degree lives outside of that construct. And so, you know, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, I want to win the lottery be, be, because money would solve everything for me. Le- like I, I still think that all the time because I'm a born degenerate and, and, and I'm like, you know, it would be really interesting to win, win the lottery. Well, why? The, what, what does winning the lottery offer me? It, it, one, for, for me, it showcases that I was right, and I am one of the luckiest people on the planet. <laughs> so it's good confirmation so it's a of, what I, thing. <laughs> of what I already know about myself. Um, two, it, it, it allows me to walk around with a, a new level of confidence, um, where and, and and that confidence is derived from an external. But it, but if I really feel into like, why would I want like, like the Texas lotto right now is like almost a billion dollars. And, and, and so it's like one of the largest lot, lotto jackpots of all time. And so I was, th- I saw the billboard when I was driving and, and I was like, dang, that's crazy. Why do I get giddy about that? And, and, and really it's, it's because 
it feels like if you have money that you could put all of these things into action and solve all of these things in in, in your life but it's really doing yourself a disservice be because like you said like, like or like Naval said like if, if you don't know how to solve the problem now you're not going to be able to effectively solve it with money. You're just going to obfuscate it. You're going to build a cushion around it, but you're not going to actually solve the problem because the problem exists within you. It's your ability to properly manage the energy of reality. And, and so to me, I'm always like, well, I would just make the problem i would just push the problems away like i wouldn't actually be solving them w within myself and 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 so then i'm like okay well how can i solve the problems right now like what what type of person can solve those problems without needing the money and and then it becomes more interesting to think about how could i become that type of person because that type of person is probably the type of person that's more likely to win the lotto anyway um and it, and so it's interesting how reverse engineering the outcome and the desired outcome in, into what type of person ultimately can successfully have that. Because there's a lot of people that that win the lottery and they lose it all. So they weren't able to successfully have it. My desire is always I want to win the lottery and then and then multiply it by 100 X. Like, like I want to successfully have that. And in order to successfully have it, you have to start becoming the type of person that can successfully have it. And then the paradox is that you end up getting it either through the lottery or some means anyway. And, and, and so why not just focus on becoming that person and letting everything else fall into place, which is taking that loafing energy, but kind of moving it into a higher octave. It makes me think about uh, when I started my podcast journey. And for those that haven't listened to me uh, spiel about this, I'll give a quick summary. I used to be in a leadership development facilitator here in Australia. I used to have a job where I flew around um, to different cities and run workshops with leaders uh, around uh, coaching and building high performing teams and uh, business acumen. And uh, I, I, there was some disparity in that role in the business and, and myself. And I had this insight to to this, just this inspiration, this calling to to start a podcast. And uh, for me, I don't do things half assed. Well, I actually do a lot of things half assed. But but when I make a decision like that, it's it's I am all in, and I sell this motorbike. I buy this camera equipment. I wasn't just starting with audio. I wasn't just starting with some poor quality thing. I wanted it to be red hot from the get go. And I, I'm quite proud now as what I was able to achieve. But for me, the wealth and the thing that I was craving and felt like I needed was time. And so it, it removed the lotto win for a second. For me at the moment, it was no. If, when I have way more time and less outward commitment, it means that I'm going to be able to read more and exercise more and uh, and really develop myself because I have the space to work on myself. And the abundance of time didn't fix those problems. The abundance of time made those things worse. As the inspiration wore off and it became a responsibility and became something that now I had all of my eggs in the basket of to be successful again, an undefined definition of success at the time, that, cre that only created more stagnation, frustration, uh, analysis paralysis, I, I, the momentum and action slowed down to a point of absolute disaster. And so I, I now I'm having these conversations with some bloody amazing people, but every minute outside of the conversation was just a complete uh, catastrophe. And then I felt like an absolute fraud to be inviting these people, to be talking to these people, to be sharing a perspective of how to uh, gleam ways to live a better life, because I was just not doing that. The abundance of time, the lotto win of time didn't fix anything. It compounded right. these things that I was avoiding. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, time is such an easy way to push your desires into a distant future where you never future. actually have to achieve them. And that was one of the things that the pandemic did really well is it forced people to recognize that, no, time isn't your issue because you literally just had two years of sitting around doing nothing. You could have written that script. You could have started the e-commerce store. You could have started blogging. You could have started a YouTube channel, but you didn't. And and it, 
the, the discomfort is in recognizing, oh, it was never about time. It was more about me not becoming the person who is capable of utilizing the resources that are available to me. And to some extent, that's one of the challenges as, as I kind of up level in, into new octaves of, of life right now. It's one of the challenges that I'm going through be, because I am really efficient with my time and yet my calendar is totally full and, and and I feel like I'm not at cause over time right now be because I just feel like time is running me ragged be because I have so much to do every single day and yet there's a part of me that recognizes because I've gone through the upgrade experience so many times that that's a lie I'm telling myself because time isn't real and, and really what I need to be focusing on are what are the railroad tracks that I can put in that allow me to do more with the time that I have. And that's the entrepreneurial journey always. And, and, and so then I'm bringing in support to help me think about what those rails look like. And of course, I'll get there and it'll be optimal and I'll feel at cause over time again until my dream gets big enough where my calendar is full again, and then I'll go through that process again. But but the recognition has to be, okay, the opportunity is for me to shift in some way about the way that I think about things, about the framework that I do things, about the team around me, about the resources that I utilize and how I utilize them. That Those are all things that that are related to my decision space and and not related to time and and so time is an excuse that we can use up oh, well there's just not an, an, enough time in the day that's both true and false at the same time and, and and the opportunity for upgrade is to recognize that there's always enough time it's just a matter of landing on the right creative mix of how all of those rails come together to make you more impactful um, with, without draining so many energy resources. It is so clear to me now, if it wasn't before, as, as to how important that definition of success being being is, you know, because you're, you're, you aren't orienting yourself or, or you don't have this uh, opportunity to become uh, the cause over time now because of a future fixed state of success in, in your business, in other ventures that you're pursuing is no, who, who is the man I am and who does he need to continue to become to, uh, to be the wizard, to be at cause over time again, to continue to compound on this journey. And what I love so much about a definition definition of success that is around being is well that again unless you are the chosen one out of seven billion who becomes enlightened even that is a very long journey to that point it is an ideal that continues to expand as you go towards it you know if we're not growing right. we're dying anyone well, and that, that, that I just had had an insight that that maybe is interesting. That's why the concept of God is interesting be, be, because God is kind of this ideal template, right, of, of what a personality could be. And, and, and it's ever expanding in, in its nature, in its love, in, in its characteristics. And, and so in many ways, it is a moving target, right? And, and, and it's always going to be just bigger than, than what you are in that moment. And so it's a perfect way to optimize and track against momentum and experience an ever increasing state of progression. And so it might be the most satisfying way that you can orient yourself to, to always know that, that God is growing based on the, the desires and inputs of the entire universe. And you're kind of riding the wake of that, right? L l l like you're receiving the the offshoot of of God's expansion and you receive that as intuitive desire and you receive that as creative inspiration. And so to me that is why I like the concept of of God be, be because I'm not interested in ever stagnating. I'm I'm interested in an eternal state of stagnation. And I recognize that I can have that in this concept that that I call God. Again, I thought that'd be a really nice one to sit on for a bit. And if I was to reflect 
Well, that's that's how I've led to a definition of an understanding of God that makes sense in the game I'm playing, you know, that like how I see God, this totality of ideals is this moving line in which I am orienting myself towards and that the judge, the intuition, the voice in my head is always pointing me and nudging me in the place that I need to be nudged to continue to build and also uh, be the director of that train that's riding the tra- the rail racks that I'm building at the same time. Uh, and yeah, so again, well, what is God? God isn't an amount of money. It's not a, a house on the water. It is not a private jet. It is a state of being. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, what a beautiful call out and a great way to again, reimagine, rearticulate, redefine what God might mean to one. Well, and it's just an interesting way for for me to kind of reanalyze like what success is. And, and, And it kind of took me a while to find the language, but success is really to align myself with that optimal state of integrity and and by being aligned with that highest state of integrity then reality orders itself in the proper way around me be be because they, there's little gapage or spots of blockage in in me be because i'm synced with that highest ideal and i mean of course fall short of that but it's an interesting target to aim for and uh, and an exhilarating experience of of feeling like w- i can remember when when i got sober and I, and I, and you know part of that is okay i'm going to start telling the truth to myself and and to others and and i've been lying to myself for a long time and and because of that there's a lot of big feelings that that have to come up and it's so satisfying to tell the truth in a situation where historically you would have lied or maybe just obfuscated the truth by by telling a half truth. Just you're not lying, but you're just not telling the whole truth. That used to be my MO, like my entire 20s, um, because I I was uncomfortable saying the truth of things and and having to go on the the nervous bull ride of of how people might respond to that. But when you start telling the truth and you tell the truth and it's temporarily uncomfortable and then it works out better than you could have imagined, that's such a satisfying experience. And then you get addicted to that experience. And that's the experience I'm addicted to right now is where I recognize the more in integrity I get, the more truth telling that that I can tell, the more that reality just hooks me up and that's fun and that's the progression and that that that's why aiming towards the ideal is is interesting why is that the case john why why is telling the truth almost a hack well i think the reason has something to do with this concept that we've talked about before called the law of attraction so your thoughts are a law of attraction event you're you're emitting a bioenergetic signal kind of like a radio signal and and, and so ba- based on the trauma that's still trapped in your body based on your past life experience you have this frequency signal that's going out and just like when you tune a radio to 101.1 and and you you get the local you know 90s rock station le- like your signal is picking up the thoughts in the field that you end up thinking and and People think that their thoughts are are in their head, but but really the brain is like a satellite dish that's picking them up out of the ether, and and so there's an infinite number of thoughts and decisions that are that are potentially available. But your bioenergetic frequency, just like tuning the radio, is going to call in the radio station that is relevant to you, and when you start telling the truth, you are confronted with discomfort. And what is discomfort? It's showing you where there's a blockage in your energy system that's preventing you from dialing to a higher radio station. And so just saying the the uncomfortable truth out loud forces you to have to process some of that, which then releases the base level energy and allows the radio station to move to, into a higher frequency, which means that you now have 
a a more optimal decision space. You you're clocked into the higher frequency decisions over here rather than the base level decisions over here. And what are you doing when you're lying? You're basically saying I don't trust reality. And so you're you're over and over sending that message of distrust into the reality feedback engine. And so then you suffer from randomness, you suffer from bad business deals gone bad. You 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 suffer from all of these things that seemingly feel like the world is against you, but really it's that you, what you're putting into the feedback loop of reality is I don't trust you and that's why I can't tell the truth. And so what a terrible thing to be programming the algorithm with. And 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 so at a minimum what you're doing when you start telling the truth is saying I trust that reality is going to do what it needs to do with me, like that it's going to give me what it gives and that I'm going to be somebody who can handle it. And that's that's much better positive programming for the feedback loop of reality that ends up bringing net rewards back to you. Yeah, right. Like what what is the outcome of distrust with someone? Well, they don't trust you back. So if you yeah. are outwardly not trusting reality, how can reality trust you back? It, it is a, a macro relationship uh, from my perspective and, and how you right. see it. And it, there's an objection right now that I can feel from from a viewer that, that that's like, well, yeah, but that's how somebody's going to f*** you over. Well, there, there's two ways to integrate w what we're talking about. You you can you can intellectually say, okay, I believe reality is is gonna back me up, but you can feel that you don't believe that. And and so what you feel is how you're actually programming reality. It, it, it's not your thoughts. You can say a thought over and over and over again to the point where you actually believe it in your gut, but until you believe it in your gut, you're programming your reality with the bioenergetics, what's happening in the body. And, 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 and so you are going to keep getting over if you, if you in your body believe that reality is going to screw you over, that randomness is, is, is a real thing. Um, where if you can actually start to have a relationship with the reality that is trusting at the bioenergetic level, and it it comes from starting to tell small truths like what what is a small thing that normally i would i would lie about that i can tell the truth on or just like making amends with people is a type of truth telling it's why it's a really effective step in in the 12 step program because you have to go and be like hey I can remember a couple of times where I was a total asshole to you and I gaslit you to make you think that it was your fault. But I just want to let you know that like that gnaws at me and I hope that we can have amends and, and move forward in a deeper level of integrity with one another. When you have that conversation with someone, one, it's deeply uncomfortable immediately followed by usually being incredibly rewarding because unless the other person is a total asshole that you don't want to be with either, like they've been subconsciously looking for an opportunity to be able to bury that hatchet. And, and, and so then there, there's this really interesting energetic clearing that happens between you and you move forward with all, without all that baggage. So by starting to tell little truths like that and make amends for lies that you've, you've, you've said in the past, you start to prove out to yourself, oh, this is actually fun. And fun is the addictive quality. And then you're going to want to keep doing it. And then, and then you're sending the right bioenergetic signal into the reality feedback engine. Yeah, and to try, try to make this a little bit more uh, pragmatic or palatable for those that might not be as uh, tuned in to the somatic uh, wizardry of uh, John's mind. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I love, I just love how you speak about the the physiological relationship. You know, like if if in your being is mistrust or perceived randomness, then you are going to orient yourself that way in the world. You know, if you don't trust the reality around you, then you are going to behave in line with that knowing or that being. So that is, that is the outward relationship. It is, isn't just the, uh, the random attraction of all of the beautiful things in the world, because you feel that you're just going to be gifted. It, it is that because your behavior aligns to that, because you are orienting yourself and the conversations you have and the people you meet and the things that you do in line with this 
absolute trust and faith that it is going to work out because I am working towards being my best self or being the person that uh, deserves that future state that I'm working towards or the love of my life or the friends that I want or the, the goal, the goal winning kick in a football game. You orient yourself in the fashion of your beliefs and belief is a lot deeper than just the thoughts that perpetuate inside your mind. It is the relationship in how you orient inward and outward in the world. Right. And, and it's really about the present moment. Like is what I'm doing right now in the present moment, do I believe that it's beneficial to my future? Because if I do, then I should just keep doing it. But if I don't, it, you know, when you get into a state of, of apathy or depression, it's almost always because you're not taking actions that are moving you towards a future that that you want. And, and so one of the easiest ways to get out of depression is to just start going on a walk around your neighborhood once a day be, because that's literal forward motion and, and it gives you the slightest dopamine hit that you said you were going to do something, you told yourself you were going to go for a walk, and then you did it. And that closes the loop that allows you to feel like you're making progress and you will immediately start to generate the bio energetic cocktail, this pharmacy in your body will start to produce the biochemicals that pull you out of your depression. And all it takes is something small. You know what? I'm going to walk to the mailbox today. Like I've been depressed before, before and I've had to tell myself, you're going to walk to the mailbox today. You're going to get the mail and you're going to come back. And then when I come back, I'm like, I did what I said what I, I was going to do. So now I'm changing the narrative that that I'm putting into the feedback loop of reality and saying, you know, sometimes I'm a person who does what they say they're going to do. And then over time, you can get to the point where you can literally say, I always do what I say I'm going to do. And that's an incredibly powerful place to be in because not only will you believe it, but everyone around you will know this is a doer. This is a guy that gets stuff done and that's who gets the opportunities. Amen. Amen. And when you say I am going to achieve X or I'm going to make X come to life or this is going to be my reality, when you are one who always does what they say they're going to do, of course, then that reality will will manifest and, and come to existence. Exactly. And affirmations really do work when you're in that place of integrity. They don't work when you're a loser. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> in, the, in that, you know you're not somebody who does what you say. So you're not going to be able to believe your affirmation. And, and so they work in the way that they make you uncomfortable. They show you what you need to feel through. They show you that you need to feel that you're not always in integrity. And so that's valuable feedback. But they don't work in the sense that they're going to immediately call in inspiration because what they're going to call in first is everything that's out of integrity. And then once you've dealt with that and you're back in integrity with yourself, that's when you get to use the magic of affirmations. That's when you get to make love to everything in your life. I, I, I love that quote earlier, you know, I just don't want to fuck life. You know, I just don't want to fuck that successful business or just fucking forget the yacht. Like I want to make love to that business. I want the intimacy of that. And, and that takes work. It takes discipline. It takes sacrifice. And for me, right. it's not and, about... And it can't be a selfish pursuit because right, anyone exactly. who knows what good intimacy is knows that it's about perfectly reading into your partner. And so that apply that to your business. You have to be perfectly reading in at an intuitive level to your business. Apply that to all your business relationships. Apply that to your sales calls. Like if you think about it as making love to that, well, what is making love? It is being so dialed in at a bioenergetic spiritual level that you understand what the situation calls for. So beautifully put. And this this to me is, to, uh, is why service is such a compounding important value of mine you know to be of service means that i'm no longer focusing on just what i need or want but i'm focusing on what the person on that sales call needs or wants what my business my team needs or wants what my partner needs or wants that is making love you know that that is intimacy 
that is uh, being in a state of giving and therefore you can receive uh, religious or not to orient yourself with service. Well, for me anyway, has been such a beautiful relationship that I'm building. I feel I see myself building that relationship. It's not just, um, okay, I'm of service now and everything that I do is of service. Well, no, I'm building a relationship with that value, that virtue. And it allows me to better understand how I need to serve myself. So now I'm going from a place of me, 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 selfish, 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 take, take, take what I can get because I, I need to achieve X to feel okay about myself. And it's more about, okay, no, how can I benefit the things and the people and the the places around me? And therefore, why is it, so it, therefore it sheds a lot and why it's so important that I am of service to myself so I can continue to do that and get better at doing that and do more of that and see that compound around me. And right. again, like I, I've, I really see that as lost as, as society moves away from fixed religion. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that we are, we are, de, uh, we are unsubscribing from the traditional uh, understandings of, of what faith was. But, but an absence of faith from what I see ultimately means an absence of service, which leads one to nihilism and, and almost narcissism. It is me, 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 me. And how can one live a fulfilling life full of love and joy and excitement and adventure and continue to compound in a progressive, beautiful way to an ideal with, with it only being about you? It, it's just, it's a zero sum game. It, yeah. the, the being game is a, it's an infinite game. It is the game and right. yeah, service. Yeah. Well, and, and it also comes down to like the definitions that you have, like being of service for you is going to be different than what I call being of service and, and different from what the monastic version of being of service is. And, and, and so I think sometimes in hustle harder, um, communities and, and philosophy, like the idea of service is I have to be in physical action, you know, driving towards an, an outcome. And that can be a brilliant way to be of service if that's the service that you're called to. Like some people are called to more monastic styles of, of service. And, and, you know, these are the healers of the world and, and the thinkers of the world. And, and you, you know, it's one of those things where as a consultant, sometimes I grapple with how busy should I, I make myself in physical action be because aren't I a better consultant when I have time to deeply contemplate things, you, you know, good consultants are hired because they have, they make the time to deeply consider things that busy CEOs may not have the time to, to think as deeply on. And, and so you just have to decide what is the value that I'm offering in, in my service and how do I best harness that? And there is a level of service that is, I'm going to be in the soup kitchen. I'm going to be helping these people. I'm going to be physically in motion. And that can feel really good. And then there's also a level of service that's more philosophical in nature where, where it's like, you know what? I'm going to block four hours a day to think deeply about this problem and then I'm going to charge $2,500 an hour for people who don't have the time to think that deeply to engage me in conversation about some of the insights that I've come to. And that can be an equally, if not more valuable form of service. But if you don't frame it properly, it can feel like laziness sometimes. And so it's really about the frame that you're operating in, not necessarily the physical action that you're taking. Really important distinction. And again, it, it comes back to that awareness, it comes back to that presence, it comes back to that, that conscious decision or that conscious orientation of self. You know, it is, it is one thing to block out the time in your calendar because you are a consultant and yes, I need time because uh, it means I can charge more. And, and I think, but then you just spend that time pissing against the wall, you know, like, and then, and then you develop this relationship and this disposition between what you're charging and the value that you're creating and, uh, the relationship that you're building with self, which ultimately will lead to disaster. Again, I spoke about the, having the abundance of time before naively assuming it was going to fix all of my character issues and it didn't, it made them way worse, which is what I needed at the time. Um, yeah. but yeah, that, that, that presence, that conscious awareness, and again, to start small, you know, it could be argued that I uh, didn't meditate the right way for the first four years of my life meditating. 
but starting small and finding stillness every day has ultimately led to such an important place in my life right now when I where I can be present a lot of my time or in a lot of my time present with a lot of my action and inaction and non-action and for me success is developing a relationship with self that is of peace is mm-hmm. of not not pride in a sense of yeah i achieved all these things and thank god for me but just but so i can be proud of myself and and know that i haven't left something on the table i uh, know that i am in pursuit towards a a, a a more effective place of of service or or just or doing my part in this big machine or this big uh, organism right well and presence is kind of i guess the goal of of success like when we talk about becoming the person that is capable of having this kind of material thing what we're talking about it is like who is that person in the present moment and then you just become that in the in each present moment and and there's a kind of satisfaction that that comes with being able to mold yourself in into something and and then the outcome like then your joy is outcome independent where where you you're just excited to be on the ride um and that's a really fun state to be in because it's where all of the ideas and and acceleration you know, comes to you and through you. Beautiful. Beautiful. What is success to you? Did we miss anything? Did we uh, coddle up something? Did we make, did you try and make things too metaphysical to not even make sense to to you guys listening? Uh, please let us know. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, John, thanks again for the opportunity this morning. It was an absolute pleasure to talk about all things success. Yeah, I enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next one.